Okay, let's get going here and welcome. And thank you for joining us. I know you're all working very hard in your pharmacy giving COVID-19 shots, but you have no idea how important it is and, and how appreciative everybody is of the hard work that you're doing right now. I'm hoping everybody gets a two shot summer so we can get a little bit of a break. So my name is Ruth Ackerman and I'm the Director of Professional Development at the Ontario Pharmacists Association otherwise known as OPA, and I will be your moderator for this evening. So on today's agenda, I will first provide a brief introduction about OPA, why OPA is highlighting the 100 years of insulin, along with our partners, BD Canada and Essentia Diabetes Care. And then I will introduce today's speakers, two pharmacy professionals who will be guiding you through today's presentation. We'd love to hear from you. And during the presentation, you can put questions in the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions then as well. And for those of you who may be new, OPA is Canada's largest advocacy organization and professional development provider for pharmacy professionals across Ontario. With over 10,000 members, OPA is committed to enhancing the pharmacy profession and excellence in patient care. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. OPA is excited to partner with BD Canada, and one of the largest global medical technology companies, and Essentia Diabetes Care, a global company dedicated to improving the health and lives of people with diabetes, to recognize this momentous and important anniversary. The revolutionary discovery of insulin was made in Canada by Sir Frederick Banting and his assistant, Charles Best. As a leading medical advancement, insulin has fundamentally changed the lives of millions around the globe. Healthcare providers like pharmacy professionals have also played a key role and have been instrumental in helping patients manage their disease. And so to commemorate the Nobel Prize winning discovery of insulin, OPA, BD and Essentia Diabetes Care are collaborating to provide a series of online events such as this one this evening. In addition, we're adding more live webinars and some educational workshops. The event and programs celebrate this milestone and focus on providing valuable guidance and resources for pharmacy professionals so they can continue to appropriately support individuals with diabetes. As accessible healthcare providers, pharmacy professionals are integral members of a diabetes care team that assists patients with insulin delivery and the best possible management of the disease. If we examine the history of pharmacy, the pharmacist's scope of practice has substantially evolved since the days of insulin discovery. Added to this expanded scope was the introduction of the new regulated healthcare professional, the registered pharmacy technician. The ability of pharmacists to work collaboratively with an additional healthcare professional with an aligned focus has opened the opportunity to provide expanded clinical care. Also, both, both professionals can apply their education to the fullest to help patients and those affected by the disease. To learn more about the history of insulin and pharmacy's involvement, visit uh, our website, opatoday.com. So tonight, we are going to hear from two individuals who strive to practice to the best of their ability, maximizing their scopes, which are complementary to one another. I'm excited to introduce you to Maggie Norad, Registered Pharmacy Technician, and Shane Narula, Pharmacist, who both collaborate to provide effective care for their patients with diabetes. And now they're going to be uh, take over the screens. And so... Maggie Norad is a registered pharmacy technician. Currently, she works at Costco Pharmacy and has been with the company since 2013. Maggie began her career in pharmacy through a school placement at Costco, where she was hired shortly after she had worked shortly after school and worked her way up from pharmacy assistant to pharmacy clerk to her current role as pharmacy technician. Since 2017, she's been teaching at Fleming College in the pharmacy technician program. Driven by her passion to educate, Maggie has guided students in the program through a variety of courses, from computer software to compounding. Maggie graduated from the pharmacy technician program at Fleming College in 2013. So Shane, Shane Narula is a 2017 PharmD graduate from the University of Toronto and is currently the pharmacy manager at Costco Pharmacy in Peterborough. Shane enjoys being involved with teaching 
and is a clinical instructor for professional practice labs in the first and second year PharmD students, as well as one of the course coordinators for the International Graduate Program Labs. Dane also likes to explore various hobbies, one of which is programming. This has led him to the development of a startup known as Pharmacy Connect, an app that allows pharmacies across Ontario an inventory sharing platform to resolve back order issues and offload excess inventory. Take it away, Shane and Maggie. Okay, thank you, Ruth, for the introduction. So I'm Maggie, um, and today I will be going over the introduction to our patient case, prescription drop-off, which is also the role of the assistant and clerk, and the role of the pharmacy technician from filling prescriptions to the final product check uh, to blood glucose monitors. Uh, Shane will then take over and go over the diabetic um, clinical refresher, a guideline update, the diabetes meds check, diabetes meds check follow-up, and insulin guidelines. We will then have a short Q&A period for you guys to ask any questions you may have. So our patient case, our patient case. So Brian is a 58 year old male who has just been diagnosed with type two diabetes. He has an A1C of 7.6. He's come into the pharmacy with a prescription for metformin, 500 milligrams BID. Brian also has a prescription for blood glucose monitor and test strips. He's unfamiliar with the various meters and would like a rec recommendation for which meter will work best for him. Brian is also covered on ODB through disability. So the next few slides are going to be about the role of the pharmacy clerk or pharmacy assistant and how they can help with diabetes management. Prescription drop-off. So step one is prescription drop-off. This will be the first encounter Brian has with the pharmacy. Drop-off or entry is usually performed by the pharmacy assistant or clerk However, registered techs can also perform this role when necessary. When a prescription is dropped off to the pharmacy, the assistant needs to confirm the patient demographics, such as date of birth and address. The assistant will also need to confirm if the patient has any allergies or medical conditions, and if these prescriptions are new for them. They will also need to ask if the patient has any drug coverage and whether or not they're waiting for this prescription. Once the assistant has confirmed that the patient has been newly diagnosed with diabetes and that these medications are new for them, they will document that the patient may be eligible for a meds check. Then the assistant, or sorry, the technician or pharmacist will review the file and offer the meds check if they're eligible. The assistant will also need to document that the patient will need a new meter and whether or not the patient has a preference of what meter they would like. For our patient, Brian, he's determined that he will need help choosing a meter. The assistant is also responsible for entering the prescriptions through the pharmacy software. They are responsible for counting and filling the medications. So they need to go pick the stock, check the stock's DIN to the DIN number on the hard copy, and count the pills. They will also be responsible for billing prescriptions through third-party plans. So billing diabetic supplies to third-party plans can sometimes be tricky. Often third-party plans will require step therapy drugs to be used first. If this is the case, the assistant will receive a rejection notice from the plan. For example, if we're trying to bill a Janumet prescription, the patient's drug plan may come back and say that the patient needs to use metformin first. If this is the case, the assistant can look at the file if the patient's been on metformin before, we can override this. If the patient has not been on metformin before, the assistant will need to flag this to the pharmacist's detention and print the rejection notice. Uh, for glucose meters, there's often STI programs available. So the STI program allows the pharmacy to bill for a meter as long as the patient has bought in test strips. So the test strips can be purchased either over the counter or through prescription. Uh, the Freestyle Libre system is the only meter that's not covered on the STI program. When billing strips, the assistant can come across some barriers as well. Some plans will simply just cover the prescription or the test strip.
ODB has put a limit on their test strips, depending on the medication the patient is using. And we'll go over that in the next slide. The newest diabetic supply uh, system is the Freestyle Sensors, which also has limitations with billing. Similar to the strips, some plans will cover them, whereas others will have the patient pay and submit. Green Shield does want the patient to pay and submit, or the pharmacy can use Provider Connect to bill these, these sensors uh, manually. Green Shield will not accept electronic billing for sensors. ODB will cover the sensors as long as the patient's on insulin. So it's important to pay attention to whether or not that patient's on insulin and have the appropriate documentation as ODB will cover them no matter what, but it's up to us to determine if they're actually eligible. So as I said, ODB has put a limit on the number of test strips a patient can receive depending on how they are managing their diabetes. If a patient is on insulin, they can have up to 3,000 strips per year. If a patient's managing their diabetes with medications that have a high risk of causing hypoglycemia, the patients can have 400 strips per year. And if the patient's managing their diabetes through diet and exercise or with medication that cause a low hypoglycemia, they can have 200 strips per year, or sorry, a low risk of causing hypoglycemia. a box of test strips to be billed per patient per year. However, this is dependent on clinical needs. For our patient, Brian, he has only brought in a prescription for metformin, which means he'll be eligible for the 200 test strips per year. So next we're going to go on to the role of the technician. One of the main roles of the technician is performing a technical check of prescriptions. So technical check of prescriptions is in the pharmacy technician's scope of practice. The pharmacy technician needs to ensure that all technical aspects of the prescription are correct, meaning the right drug, right dosage form, strength, manufacturer, and quantity, that the right pharmaceutical calculations have been completed, the right quantity has been dispensed, ensure the expiry date on the medication is within good standing, and ensure the medication has been labeled properly. The next role the pharmacy technician has with diabetes management is glucose meters. Uh, the technician is responsible for being knowledgeable about glucose meters as we are required to help educate and recommend meters to patients. The next few slides will be a brief overview of the various meters on the market and then we will take that information to make a recommendation for our patient. Oh. Okay, so meter brands, uh, the main meter brands are One Touch, which offers Vario Reflect and Vario Flex, uh, Contour Next, which offers Contour Next, Contour Next Ease, Contour Next One, and Contour Next Link 2.4, AccuCheck, which offers the AccuCheck Guide, and Freestyle. Freestyle, which offers the Freestyle Libre, Freestyle Lite, and Freestyle Precision Neo. Most meters that are available are similar in the way they work. They offer quick and accurate testing, and the majority of them do connect through Bluetooth to offer more features. Most brands of meters do also have an app available to allow the patient to gain more access. All of these functions are additional features that the patient may or may not use. Okay, so we will start with the One Touch meters, which offers Vario Flex and Vario Reflect. One Touch used to also offer the um, One Touch Ultra. However, we're trying to move patients more towards the Vario. So first we have the Vario Flex, which is the basic model for One Touch Vario. 
It offers color shore technology, which you can see on the bottom here. If the arrow is pointing to the green section, the reading is within range. If it's pointing towards the red color, the reading is high. And if it's towards the blue color, then the reading is low. So again, on the picture that we have here, you can see the reading is 5.8 and it's pointing to down towards the green, meaning it's within range. This meter is compact and the screen is large enough to make it easy to read. This is a simple meter and is great for people who are unfamiliar with technology. It gives them feedback with the color shore technology, but is not overwhelming. The meter does offer Bluetooth and pairing with apps if the patient wants. However, they can use it as simple as just giving a reading. Next, we have the Vario Reflect. So the Vario Reflect is the more advanced option for one touch. Again, it offers that color shore. However, this meter is showing through a graph rather than just an arrow pointing to the color. The meter also provides emojis with their color shore. And if the reading is good, a smiley face will appear. Along with their color shore, it does offer automatic messaging. Uh, so if the reading is low, it will tell the patient that the reading's low and give them some suggestions to help get their blood sugars up. So as you can see from this um, here, it does use the color shore with the blue, says that it's low and um, gives them a suggestion to try and increase their sugars. Similar to the Vario Flex, it is compact and easy to read. It offers quick testing and, and has the Bluetooth feature. This meter is great for newly diabetic patients who are familiar with technology. It allows them to do, see more than just a number. This meter will help patients to understand their readings and it gives them an incentive to get their readings within range. Next, we have the Contour Next meters, which offers Contour Next, Contour Next Ease, Contour Next 1, and Contour Next Link 2.4, which is usually used for insulin pump patients. So first we have the Contour Next Ease. This is the basic model for Contour Next. Again, it offers quick, accurate testing. And with Contour Next, there is the second chance sampling, which means if the patient wants it able to test again. <laughs> um, it also offers fast results. Then we have Contour Next, which is the slightly more advanced option. It's still very simple and basic, offers quick, fast testing, and it's easy to read. The model does ask you to mark the readings whether or not it's post or pre-meal, or if you were fasting. This is an option that's available in the easy model. However, it's not mandatory. Whereas this one, it will request you to add in that result with, with the test. It's also available in 14 different languages. Next, we have the Contour Next one. Uh, so Contour Next 1 is the more advanced option for Contour Next. This model is seen in pharmacies more often than the other two. This meter is um, similar to the One Touch Vario as it offers a smart light feature. So if your sugars are above target, the light at the end will be yellow. If they're in range, the light at the end will be green. And if they're below range, the light at the end will be red. So that's referring to the green light in this picture. Um, so in this circumstance, the reading was within range. Um, as the other contour next meters, this one does offer the second chance sampling if they weren't able to get enough blood on that first sample. Contour next one also pairs seamlessly with the contour next app via Bluetooth. The app opens up more features for this meter. You're able to add notes to your reading, whether or not it was pre or post meal, pre or post workout, or what medications you had recently taken. The app also allows for smart alert, 
tests, which alerts you to whether or not your tests are high and offers advice on your next steps. Through the app, you are also able to see trends within your reading and share these reports and data with your healthcare provider. This meter is great as it's small and compact. However, you can on only access the extended features through the app. So if your patient has a smartphone and is familiar with apps, then it's a great feature. If they don't have a smartphone or aren't familiar with how apps work, it can be used as a very basic meter. A lot of patients do like how small it is and that it can easily fit in a pocket or purse and allows those extended features with the use of your phone. However, this size can also be a negative aspect for anyone that may misplace it or um, drop it or have some issues handling it with it being so tiny. Next, we have the AccuCheck. So there's AccuCheck Guide and AccuCheck Aviva. So patients may still be using the AccuCheck Aviva, but it's no longer available. So we are trying to switch the patients to Guide. AccuCheck Guide mainly markets their meter towards their test strip design. As I said in the beginning, the majority of the meters are similar in how they work, and they offer fast, quick, and accurate testing. AccuCheck also offers more with its MySugar app. The test strip with this meter, as I said, is the selling point. They offer a spill-resistant container, and the shape of the container makes it easier for patients to remove just one strip. The guide test strip has the dosing area at the entire bottom edge of the strip. The patient is able to apply blood to any part of the yellow strip and get results. So that's referring, it's hard to see here, but the very bottom of the test strips, there's just a yellow strip that's going horizontal. So the patient's able to apply blood to anywhere on that horizontal strip, rather than having it the vertical and having to get the blood drop directly within that vertical line. Uh, the guide also has an eject button for test strips. The patient can, the patient This meter is great for seniors or anyone with shaking hands. The patient does not have to worry about proper placement of the blood drop to get their test, and they don't have to fight with the strip canister to get a strip out or worry about knocking it over. This meter can also be, also be used at its simplest setting, or again, you can pair it with the MySugar app to open up more features. Next, we have the Freestyle uh, meters, which offers Freestyle Precision Neo, Freestyle Libre and Libre 2, and Freestyle Light. Now, the Freestyle Light is the most basic model for Freestyle. It offers quick testing and is small and compact. It also has a backlight and a strip port light to help with testing. So um, this one, again, is not seen as often in pharmacies, but your patients still may be using it. Next, we have the Freestyle Precision Neo. So this meter is no longer available. Um, however, it was the first meter to allow at-home blood glucose and ketone testing. So although the Precision Neo meter is no longer available, it can be used with the Libre meter. Uh, this is often seen with pediatric patients as they can use both the Libre assist. They can also use the Libre meter to do the ketone testing. Um, one thing to note, so even though that these strips can be used with the Libre meter, it's important to know the Libre does not come with a lancing device. So if you have a patient that is getting the Libre system, as well as the precision test strips, it's important to add a lancing device in with that or confirm if they already have one at home. So next we have the Freestyle Libre. So we have the meter and we have the sensors. So this is the newest glucose monitoring system. It's a different approach to testing. The patient applies the sensor to their arm and wears it continuously for 14 days. 
then the sensor is removed and a new one is applied. This is a great new way for patients who are newly diagnosed with diabetes to test their sugars as it eliminates finger pricking and allows patients to test by simply um, scanning the meter over the sensor. It's also compact and lightweight. It has a backlight screen, provides a user-friendly, easy to read graph, stores 90 days of reading, and it can be used with either the Libre app or the Libre meter. Again, if your patient is planning to use the precision test strips, they so although this is a great new uh, way for patients to test, they, some patients do have a hard time applying the sensor or keeping the sensor on. Um, a lot of the elderly patients sometimes seem that it's not working even after a week. So there are still some kinks depending on your patients. Okay, so now that we've had a refresher on the various types of meters, we'll go back to our patient, Brian. So Brian's familiar with technology and he has a smartphone. He has just been diagnosed with diabetes and would benefit from a meter that offers more than just a number as he's learning what these numbers mean. I would recommend the Contour Next one. It offers the smart light feature so Brian can get used to what his readings mean. It's small and compact and easy for him to carry around with his pocket. Offers the second chance sampling as he's a newly diabetic patient, this may be useful. It also seamlessly hooks up with the Contour Diabetes app, where he's able to add additional information on his testing and get feedback on what these readings mean. He's also able to share these with his healthcare provider. It also offers accurate testing. The last step that the technician plays with Died. I've chosen a meter for Brian and filled his prescriptions. We move on to how to use that meter. So I always like to separate the meter demonstrations into two to separate parts. So we have the Lansing device and we have the meter. So the Lansing device is what pricks the finger and that's important to inform the patient. So the steps for the Lansing device is to remove the cover, insert a lancet, and remove the protective disc to expose the needle. Twist that cap back on. Then we'd have to load the lancet by pulling back and press it firmly against the finger. Then pushing the button to inject the needle and massaging the finger to get a good drop of blood. It's also important to mention the depth indicator numbers on the lancet device. Usually I have patients start at about a three or a four and increase the number if they're not getting enough blood and decrease in the number if, it's, if it hurts. Once the patient's comfortable with the Lansing device, we move on to the meter itself. So uh, with the meter, we set the meter up for the patient. Usually it's the date and time. Sometimes ranges and other things need to go in and you'd have to constraint. I have them insert a test strip. By inserting the test strip, it shows that the meter will automatically turn on and it then asks the patient to apply blood. For a meter demonstration, you can have the patient do a full test with you if they'd like, or you can just use the control solution. So once they've completed a test, either doing a test on themselves or using just the control feature or control solution, we go through the features of the meter with the patient. So you can show them where the trends are, where the um, readings will be kept, go through the history, how to mark the readings, whether or not it's pre or post meal, pre or post workout, however they want to organize it. Depending on the patient, you can also show them a log book. So if the patient is just going to use the meter as is, they don't want to use any of the extra bells and whistles, and they just want the number, 
you can give them a logbook to document those readings so they have something to show their healthcare provider. It's also important to give the patient a sharps container and explain that all of the needles, uh, lancets, and test strips will go into that sharps container and then they'll bring it back to the pharmacy when it's full to get a new one. Once um, the patient consultation with the pharmacist and I will pass you off to Shane. Oops. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Ruth. As mentioned, my name is Shane. I'm the pharmacy manager at the Costco in Peterborough and I will be going over the consultation with the pharmacist and showing how the pharmacist along with the technician and other pharmacy staff can come together to help create better health outcomes for patients. So we'll start with a diabetes clinical refresher. So some of the risk factors for diabetes include an age over 40, a family history of diabetes, the person's background, typical backgrounds could include African, Arab, Asian, or Hispanic as being more predisposed, a pre-diabetes history, and organ damage. And organ damage could include microvascular complications such as retinopathy, neuropathy, or nephropathy, or it could be larger CV issues such as coronary or cerebrovascular. Vascular risk factors as well include uh, HDL levels below one in males or 1.3 millimoles in females, increased triglyceride levels above 1.7, hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Other comorbidities could include pancreatitis, polycystic ovary syndrome, gout, just to name a few. And some medications can also contribute to affecting sugar levels, such as glucocorticoids, antipsychotics, and anti-rejection drugs. Next is the diagnosis of diabetes, which could be based on a fasting blood glucose level above seven, an A1C blood test above 6.5, or a glucose reading of 11.1 .1 millimoles two hours after a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. To reduce the risk of diabetes, studies suggest a 5% loss of initial body weight. This can be accomplished by moderate intensity physical activity of at least 150 minutes per week, which results in moderate weight loss of approximately 5% of the initial body weight. Diet options include the DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the Mediterranean diet, and the alternative healthy eating index. These various diets have similar concepts, which include more whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, lean meat, and reduction in things such as alcohol, red meat, processed meat, and sugar beverages. This slide helps demonstrate how collaborative, interactive, and individualized approaches with the patient and those involved with the circle of care can help bring patient care together. It's been shown that educational interventions that emphasize knowledge, emotional and behavioral support, coping strategies, and self-management training are all associated with improved glycemic control at all ages. Just a reminder about general A1C targets. For most diabetics, it tends to be less than 7%. Adults with type 2 diabetes may have a more aggressive target, such as an A1C of 6.5%, to reduce risk of CKD, or chronic kidney disease, and retinopathy if they're at a low risk of hypoglycemia. However, for people who are functionally dependent, have recurrent severe hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia unawareness, or limited life expectancy, or are frail and elderly with dementia, we can consider a more uh, lax target of under 8.5%. Fasting blood glucose target for most people range between four to seven millimoles. However, we consider more aggressive fasting blood glucose and to our postprandial levels if A1C is not being reduced enough, 
uh, passing blood glucose levels between four to 5.5 and two hour prosprandial levels between five to eight can be considered, but this needs to be uh, weighed against the risk of hypoglycemia. For self-monitoring of blood glucose, for type two patients not on insulin, self-monitoring of blood glucose is most effective within six months of diagnosis. The frequency to which to test depends on the medications, the level of glycemic control, and the risk of hypoglycemia. If glycemic control is not achieved, we can do periodic pre and postprandial measurements. For a type one or two diabetic on insulin, if insulin is being used more than once a day, the person should test at least three times daily, including both pre and postprandial measurements. If they're only using insulin once a day, then they can test once daily at variable times. You can also consider flash glucose monitoring systems such as Freestyle to help reduce time spent in hypoglycemia. And it may also lower the need to test frequently, but won't completely negate the need to test. Flash glucose monitoring is checking the sugar levels in the interstitial fluid, whereas the finger prick test is directly measuring from the blood. Therefore, flash glucose monitoring systems may not be as accurate at extreme low or high ranges, or if blood glucose levels are changing rapidly. For type 1 diabetics, they may also need to perform ketone testing during periods of acute illness, accompanied by increased blood glucose levels, or when preprandial blood glucose levels remain above 14, or if diabetic ketoacidosis is suspected. So in summary, these are the main clinical refreshers we need to remember about. A1C target, usually under seven. Blood pressure target, usually under 130 over 80. Cholesterol target is usually an LDL under two. Drugs to help cardiovascular disease include ACE or ARBs, statins, ASA, SGLT2s, or GLP1s with cardiovascular benefit. Exercise should be 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity a week with resistance training two to three times a week. Diet should include options such as DASH or Mediterranean diets with low glycemic index foods. Screen for complications, ECGs every three to five years if person is age 40 plus, or diabetic complications such as the monofilament test for feet, GFR and ACR test for kidneys, retinal exams for retinopathy, offer smoking cessation if the person smokes, and again, self-management and encouragement of individualized goal setting. Diabetes guideline updates. So in 2020, the CDA guidelines were updated due to updated trials and evidence on the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s. So first we'll look at some of the GLP-1s. In the LEADER trial, liraglutide, which is Victoza, was associated with lower outcomes of MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, and significantly fewer deaths. So MACE could be a composite endpoint that includes events such as non-fatal MI, stroke, et cetera, all pooled into one number. In the Sustain 6 trial, semaglutide, also known as Ozempic, lowered MACE events. However, the trial was not designed to look for CV benefit superiority. So the evidence for CV benefit was graded lower for semaglutide than liraglutide. The Pioneer 6 trial looked at oral semaglutide, ribelsis, which did not demonstrate significant reductions in composite MACE outcomes, but the death from CV causes was significantly lower. However, this should be interpreted with a grain of caution given the small number of events and shorter duration of follow-up. Now moving on to the SGLT2 trials, the 2020 update looked at four to five new trials. The EMPA reg outcome trial looked at empagliflozin or Jardians, which had lower outcomes of MACE, a significant decrease in CV mortality, however, no reductions in non-fatal MI or stroke. However, it was noted that the secondary endpoint 
was met of lowered kidney disease progression. The CANVAS trial looked at canagliflozin in Volcana, which lowered MACE composite outcomes pulled together, but again, no significant differences in individual outcomes. The declared TIMI trial showed dapagliflozin for Ziga was non-inferior to placebo in lowering MACE outcomes and still demonstrated lower incidence of CV death and heart failure. Also, the study showed a significant reduction in kidney disease progression. So what we can see from these SGLT2 trials is that they all seem to lower MACE outcomes overall when the composite outcome data is combined to include multiple CV events. However, for individual outcomes, the reduction was not as significant. So while SGLT2s might not significantly improve individual cardiovascular outcomes, in all three trials, we see some reduction of MACE and strong evidence of reducing heart failure and progression of kidney disease. Therefore, there were further studies done to specifically look at SGLT2s with the primary outcomes being changed to focus on heart failure and chronic kidney disease. So from the DAPA-HF trial, the trial specifically now looked at dapa glyphosin lowering heart failure as the primary outcome. And the majority of the participants in this trial did not even actually have diabetes. There was still reduction in heart failure CV death and all cause mortality from using dapagliflozin in heart failure patients. So this may explain why you're seeing an increase in Forziga being prescribed for patients with heart failure without necessarily having diabetes. The Credence trial looked at canagliflozin in Mokana, lowering kidney disease as the primary outcome. Would this would mean delaying NCH kidney disease, preventing serum creatinine from doubling, preventing CV or renal death. Canagliflozin demonstrated lower risk of kidney disease progression, lower risk of maize, and lower risk of heart failure. So this trial also supports the use of SGLT2s in patients with CKD and GFRs above 30 mils per minute to reduce the risk of kidney progression. So this is now the new guideline update. So for patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, or heart failure, or age above 60 with cardiovascular risk factors, the new recommendation is to add or substitute an antihyperglycemic agent with demonstrated cardiorenal benefit. The recommendation is then further broken down depending on what type of condition the patient has. So we can see that the GLP here has a grade A recommendation for lowering the risk of MACE for those with CVD or CV risk factors. SGLT2s also have done a grade A recommendation for chronic kidney disease, heart failure, and progression of neuropathy. Additionally, for people that have an A1C above target, but may have less CV risk factors, the GLP-1 and SGLT-2s are still preferred for the cardiorenal benefit in high-risk populations. So now that we have our background information, we can look at doing the diabetes medication review with the patient. The diabetes med review provides an opportunity for the pharmacist to engage the patient in a focused medication review, including advice, training, monitoring, and education on diabetes. The objectives of a diabetes medication review include promoting healthier patient outcomes and self-management of diabetes, improving and optimizing drug therapy and improved lifestyle, achieving safe, effective, and appropriate use of all types of medications, medication devices, and supplies, ensuring proper disposal of unused and or expired medication, and aligning with the ministry's diabetes strategy. So some tips for consultations. So try to put yourself in the patient's shoes and set the stage for the patient, set an agenda, timing, what paperwork is required. Try to encourage the patient to bring in their lab reports, their blood glucose readings, or whatever they have with them. And try to set aside an appointment time with them, perhaps when they're coming in to collect their next uh, refill for their medications. 
educate on self-management as diabetes, as it is a complex and a chronic condition. Consider the volume of information being given to the patient and try to avoid information overload. Identify issues for further follow-ups and don't try to solve every single problem in one sitting. Things can be spaced out with appropriate follow-up appointments. So the diabetes meds check can be done for patients who are diagnosed with either type one or type two diabetes and take a medication for their condition. The meds check follow-up for diabetes can be done if the person has received a diabetes meds check at the same pharmacy and they need a follow-up for monitoring, device training, or diabetes education. In addition to giving the patient a copy of their personal medication record, they must also be given a copy of the diabetes education patient take home. Meds check resources. So the OPA has some good resources on the Beyond the Counter series. It's a series of videos that guides both pharmacists and technicians through engagement with the patient all the way through to follow up. There's also a comprehensive diabetes education course offered by them. The ministry has good resources too to review objectives, patient eligibility, and documentation procedures. And the central forms repository contains all the necessary forms that you would need. So now with the diabetes meds check, we know they can take some time. Sometimes they can take 30 minutes or longer. And it seems like over half the time is spent info gathering. So here's where I find that we can work together collaboratively with your pharmacy staff and technician to help with some of this info gathering. This can easily save you 10 to 15 minutes of time and let you focus more on the education aspects of the meds check. The technicians can also help with the device demonstration, which gives you time to either set up other aspects of the meds check or focus on other tasks. By utilizing the technician to do info gathering and device demos, this allows the pharmacist to focus on general diabetes education, certain aspects of self-monitoring and blood glucose, such as the testing frequency, hypoglycemia management, and if on insulin, can provide further education on the various types of insulin and dosage adjustments. On this slide, we can talk about the general diabetes education points on the left side and some of the sugar management items on the right side. Patient involvement and focus on goals. Note that it likely won't be possible to go over every single educational component in one sitting and it would probably be too much information for the patient to try to absorb all at once, especially if this is very new for them. It's important to focus on one or two goals the patient has for the initial assessment and provide more info in follow-ups when the patient has a better understanding of their condition and medications. Follow-up. So where a technician can help. The next step we have here is a follow-up where the patient has been sent home after their initial diabetes meds check, and now they come back maybe three to six months later, possibly for a refill prescription or a new prescription. This is where you can check in to see how the patient is doing with their medication. Do they have any confusion? Are they compliant? How are their blood sugar levels? When was the last meds check done? Has there been medication changes since the last consultation? This is where the person at entry or the technician can come and check with the pharmacist if a follow-up meds check would be appropriate. Explain the importance of the follow-up with the patient and book an appointment for a meds check follow-up if necessary. You can also try to time follow-ups with refill pickups if possible. And you can follow up on specific tasks that the patient identified during your initial meds check consultation with them. During the follow-up, there's multiple topics you could go over, including the device usage, such as meter, strips, or sharps, glycemic control, cardiovascular and renal status, complications involving the eyes, feet, or kidneys, efficacy, side effects, ability to take current medications, and reinforce and support healthy behaviors, such as diet and exercise. Possible topics to discuss and follow up. 
Some of these you may have already covered in the initial meds check, but they may need a review again. Or if it wasn't reviewed the first time, now might be a good time to review it since the patient now has a better understanding of what to expect. Example interventions. So for many patients, cost and coverage is a major concern. And GLP-1s, even though they're highly recommended, tend to be pretty expensive. So if the patient can't afford a GLP-1, then we may want to consider an SGLT-2, which might be slightly cheaper, but as we know, is still a somewhat expensive option. If the patient can't afford either a GLP-1 or SGLT-2, then we might need to consider another class, like a sulfonyl, something like glicoside, or another class of medication, maybe something like acarbos. While these may not necessarily demonstrate improvements in CV outcomes, it might be worth at least trying to offer these for glycemic control rather than let the patient go away with nothing and their condition get worse. If the patient can't afford insulin, maybe we can try switching them to something that has a biosimilar, something like Bisaglar or Adenolog, which might reduce the cost per box by 20 or 30 bucks at least. If the patient is looking to reduce pill burden or is having compliance issues, we can try to suggest switching regular metformin BID over to metformin ER once daily. Or if they're taking multiple meds, such as metformin and a DPP-4, we can suggest a combination medication, such as Genumet, Gentituetto, Comboglyze, or if they're on a metformin SGLT-2 medication, uh, switching to the combo, such as Zigduo, Invoke Comet and Sinjardi. This chart helps show potential add ons that may be needed given the patient's comorbidities and lab values. For patients with cardiovascular disease, such as ischemia, arterial disease, or carotid disease, it's recommended they be on a statin, ACE or ARB, and ASA. If glycemic control is not at target, then consider adding on SGLT2 or GLP1. Patients that may have microvascular disease, such as retinopathy, kidney disease, or neuropathy, should be on a statin and an ACE or an ARB. Or if they're over 55 and have cardiovascular risk factors, they should be on both as well. Lastly, if the patient is over 40, or over 30 with diabetes for 15 plus years, or falls under the criteria for statin therapy, then the statin can be considered. So as a follow-up to our earlier patient case, Brian visits his family doctor six months later, and he gets a new refill for his metformin at 500 milligrams BID. You get his blood work results in as well. You notice his A1C has barely improved from 7.6 to 7.5. You also notice he's over 55 and his LDL is above four. What interventions can we recommend here? So first we wanna investigate why the medication may not be working. Is there a compliance issue, an interaction issue, et cetera? We can consider a dose increase on the metformin to 1,000 milligrams BID. It might also be reasonable to consider an add-on therapy as well, such as an SGLT2 or GLP-1 if other cardiovascular risk factors are present. Alternatively, we can also wait to see what the results from the above dose increase does before going on to this step. Also, given his other risk factors and cholesterol levels, we can consider adding on a low-dose statin insulin management. So this year marks the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, and we've come a long way since 1921, where Banting and Best and McLeod figured out how exactly to extract insulin from pancreatic islet cells in their research lab at the University of Toronto. However, fast forward 100 years to 2021, and now diabetes or prediabetes can affect up to one in three Canadians, which is huge. So the guidelines for insulin recommendations have also been slightly updated to accommodate for the new evidence for GLP-1s and SGLT-2s. 
If the decision is made to start insulin, a basal insulin should be added first and titrated to achieve fasting glucose targets. If A1C is not at target within three to six months, therapy can be advanced. However, the next line option is to add a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 before going forward and adding a bolus insulin dose. So adding a GLP-1 or SGL-2 after the basal insulin has a grade A recommendation now. This is the CDA prescription template and it comes as two pages. This page explains how to start insulin and titrate it. If we look at the boxes on the right side, we can see the usual way to start insulin is at 10 units at bedtime and then titrate up by one unit every night until the fasting blood glucose levels reach four to seven. If we're adding on both basal and bolus insulins, the second box gives us an example of what to do. The total daily insulin amount can be calculated by 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilogram. In this example, they've gone with 0.5 units per kilogram and the person is 100 kilograms. So we arrive at a total daily dose of 50 units 40% of 50 units is 20 units. So 20 units would be the basal bedtime dose. And the other 30 units would be divided three times a day to get 10 units TID with meals. The last example shows how to start someone on mixed insulin, such as a Humalog mix or Novo mix. The suggestion here is 10 units before breakfast and before supper and then titrating each dose until the pre-supper and fasting levels are four to seven millimoles respectively. And then here's the second page, an example of what the actual prescription template looks like with all the insulins listed there and all the supplies listed at the bottom. Going back to our patient case follow-up with Brian, two years later, Ryan's diabetes is still unfortunately not under control. His A1C is 7.8, despite being on metformin 1,000 milligrams PID and semaglutide one milligram weekly. He's open to the idea of trying insulin to bring down his sugar levels. We can suggest starting with a basal insulin, such as glargine 10 units QHS, and increase by one unit nightly until fasting blood glucose levels are between four to seven. He'd also want to see when the last consultation was and consider an annual diabetes meds check if he's due for one. We'll need to increase the testing frequency to one to two times per day, fasting level and another level throughout the day, such as two hours postprandial. Patient might also need a review on devices, needles, lancets, et cetera, if applicable. As mentioned earlier, after starting a basal insulin, the guidelines now recommend trying a GLP-1 or SGLT-2, then going to bolus insulin doses. So there's a few different strategies on how to add the bolus insulin. Strategy B suggests here starting with one meal, such as breakfast for the basal insulin, or sorry, bolus, and increasing by one unit daily until the two hour postprandial glucose level is below eight for pre-meal glucose levels before the next meal and it's four to seven. Strategy C is a bit different and sort of like the example we reviewed earlier with calculating total daily insulin by using 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 units per kilogram times the person's weight, then taking 40% of that as the bolus dose and the remaining 60% gets divided into three meals which equates to 20% per meal. So the patient case follow-up, Brian brings in his logbook and you see his two hour postprandial measurements are always above 10 millimoles. His fasting blood glucose levels are now regularly in the six to seven range. And he's taking 20 units of glargine QHS. He weighs about 180 pounds or 80 kilograms. The dosing range we saw earlier was 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilogram. At 0.3 units per kilogram times his weight of 80, we get 24 units of total insulin per day. Considering he's already on 20 units a day, 
increasing the total daily amount to 24 units likely won't help that much. At 0.5 units per kilogram times 80 kilograms, we get 40 total units per day. So we'll go with that for this example. So 40% basal insulin, 40% of 40 units is 16 units. And 20% bolus is eight units per meal. So we can recommend lowering his glargine to 16 units QHS and adding on a fast acting insulin such as Lispro, eight units TID. An alternative strategy that could be used here if the person is already on insulin is to leave the bolus insulin dose the way it is. So leave the bolus insulin dose at 20 units and then take 10% of this, which is two units and make that the dose per meal. So two units TID with each meal and leave the bolus insulin at 20 units. So to wrap up our patient case here, Brian comes back a few months later with his logbook and you notice significant improvement. His fasting blood glucose levels are still below seven and his postprandial glucose levels are now below 10. However, you do notice that some postprandial glucose readings are below four multiple times a week. At this point, you might wanna consider a follow-up meds check and discussing hypoglycemia, carb intake versus insulin usage, sick day management, etc. So we can see that from start to finish that Brian's journey through the pharmacy may have just started at entry when he dropped off his prescription to a clerk. Then he was further engaged by the technician and the pharmacist. So it truly is a team approach to help improve the patient experience and diabetes care from multiple aspects. And I'm glad I can work in an environment where I can help collaborate with my other staff to help patients out. That being said, I would like to thank the OPA, BD, and Essentia for helping support today's talk and making it possible. And I would like to hand it back to Ruth for any questions and last minute comments that may have come up. Thank you very much, uh, Maggie and Shane. It was, uh, it was very, very interesting. I'm sure your patients are really, really happy and really lucky to have you. We actually have some, some questions. So I'm just gonna start from the beginning. So Maggie, you might be the, way, the one on point right now. So when ODB covers Libra sensor, how many per year? And is the year considered August to August? Uh, so it is, from what I've found, 33 sensors per year. Um, I do believe that it goes based on when that, that first prescription was filled, just like the test strips. Perfect. How many, how many glucometer devices can a patient ask for in a year? Is there a limit? Uh, through, like meaning through the STI program? I'm assuming that's the, the question. So I don't believe there is any um, kind of cutoff with the STI program. It's definitely more based on your professional judgment. So is the patient getting one every other week? Is there maybe something wrong with how they are using the meter or are they losing them or what's going on? You kind of need to look at the patient file, use mm -hmm. your professional judgment. Um, a lot of the times it might just be, they need one at work, one at home, one in the car, maybe they need them variety of places or for kids, they might need one at daycare, one at school, one at home. So it's kind of reviewing your, the patient file using your professional judgment and determining whether or not they actually need that many meters. Yeah, and I'm always a big fan of documenting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you guys can answer this or not. What's the most accurate blood glucose meter on the market? Uh, anything that I have seen contour next um, one says that it has a 95% accuracy rate. Um, any of the other ones that I did a little more digging into didn't actually give me an exact rate. Mm -hmm. So I would say that contour next one is, is high up there. That's great. Um, so how many diabetes meds checks follow-ups are you allowed to do in a year? I don't know if you know the answer to this, Shane. You're on mute, Shane. There we go. Can't do a webinar without someone on mute. 
So technically, I believe there is no limit to the number of follow-ups that can be performed per patient in an annual time frame, but they must meet the appropriate documentation and criteria. The main reason for a follow-up being a discharge, a referral, a pharmacist documented decision or planned hospital admission. Uh, probably to be on the safe side, I would say quarterly. So maybe every three months. So you have one annual plus three follow-ups. Yeah, I would say that um, from all the work that I've done on diabetes meds checks is that they really are about managing this chronic long-term condition. It's complex. And the follow-ups are very, very specific to the patient. Some patients, you're just wasting your time doing follow-ups. But there are other patients that I think that they deserve, you know, more frequent follow-ups. And also, if you're changing insulin doses and they're have, struggling with things, that's the time when you're going to have to do some more follow-ups. So I think that as healthcare professionals, we can ourselves justify why we're doing these interventions with the patients. And, uh, you know, there'd be many times where you do an intervention two or three a, uh, a week or two weeks, and then you won't be having to do any follow-ups for a long time because they're, they're happy they're on the right, right direction. So, um, okay, here's another one. Any, con any concerns about metformin? Okay, we were just, I think this person was talking about your case when you were talking about the metformin use. This was at uh, the first part. I um, thought there was concern about possible negative side effects. We're talking like GI upset or? I think those issues are with long-term use of metformin. I think. With, we can, like on top of insulin, is that what they're referring to? Yeah, I don't think, I think it was just that uh, he was taking that you were discussing metformin use that despite the metformin, it was not working. And you were talking about um, non-adherence. Yeah, so that's a potential yeah. thing to look in the follow-up case, why the person's A1C levels might have been going up. Uh, just ruling out other reasons why, other than was it due to non-compliance, et cetera, or it's just not working enough? Is the patient not altering their diet or making any changes and that's why the medication is not working? Yeah, some, always investigate that before you do anything. Mm -hmm. um, someone was looking for a, a reference for your insulin titration table. I'm assuming uh, Diabetes yeah. Canada. Yeah, Diabetes Canada. Yeah. Um, so coverage of meter and strips, if the patient is already using Freestyle Libra system. So if they're using the Libre system um, and they want to switch to a new meter, the meter would still be covered through the STI program if they were trying to switch to Contour or One Touch or where, wherever they wanted to go. Um, and the test strips would still be covered on ODB. They would still be covered on the private plan as long as the private plan did cover them. Um, patients will still use a variety of meters like the sensor might not work for them or they need to have a backup testing. So it would still go through the drug plans. Excellent. So some of these questions are getting hard. <laughs> what, are the that, what are the contraindications to ACE or ARB for a patient with type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease? And what is an alternative choice? Hmm. That's a good question. Let's see, contraindications to ACE ARBs, pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, and some there's and then, some kidney uh, issues as well, as well yeah. for contraindications. In terms of alternatives with a patient with type 2 diabetic that's having hypertension issues, I think the recommended hypertension guidelines say to go with calcium channel blocker as a second line option. So I'm lodipine. Yeah, I think we're looking at the SGLT2s as well, I think. I don't know. I'm a Part B pharmacist. I shouldn't answer any of these questions. <laughs> I think they're asking for alternatives to ACE or ARB. So if the patient has yeah, cardiovascular exactly. issues with type 2 diabetes, the recommended add-on for hypertension purposes would be a calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blocker, yeah. Do you have to be a diabetic, diabetic educator to do a meds check for a diabetic? patient? 
I think that used to be the case when it first came out, but I think that's changed since then. Yes, you have to you have to demonstrate that you've done significant educational um, courses. And our course that we offer at OPA is about 12, 13 CEUs, I think might even be more. And it, um, it fills the requirements for being um, to doing diabetes meds checks. The other question buried in here is, well, if you don't have that education, can you do an annual instead? And yeah, but if you're doing the annual, then you would need to make sure they're on three or more meds. Yeah. yeah. Um, how much is the doctor involved in the various stages of intervention? So if you're changing a prescription, then they'd most likely need to be involved. So besides just titrating, uh, you know, the patient titrating a dose that says as directed, you're probably going to need to fax the doctor at least most of the time to keep them involved with this. I think there's a part portion of the diabetes meds check that needs to be faxed to the primary. Yeah, care it needs provider. to be faxed to them. But even in general, I think if you're making a suggestion to a medication change, you would obviously let the doctor know as well. So I'd assume even if you're not doing the diabetes consultation, their MD is probably going to be involved at most ages. Yeah, the best way. Can we dispense and bill ODB for Libra sensor plus regular test strips at the same time? Yes, I wouldn't see an issue with that because it's two different um, systems. And again, a patient can be using two different systems. So yeah, you wouldn't be able to build two boxes of different test strips at the same time? No, but because the strips and the sensors are different, it, that's fine. Yeah, because the Libra can fall off, that little thing it, can fall off. Right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a good one. How long is a glucometer good for and when should you change to a new one? Uh, I would say that is very dependent on how often it's being used, um, how the patient's handling it. Usually within a year, I tell patients that maybe it's time to upgrade or if they're getting a lot of error codes mm -hmm. um, or just having some issues with it, I suggest changing. So I guess my rule of thumb is a year, but some patients have been using the same glucometer for years. Do you think you need to do a follow-up with a patient? It depends on your patient. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> do you find that you need to do a follow-up with a patient a day or two later? Yes, that's what you're saying. Sometimes you do need to follow up. I would say from, from some of my relatives, you need to do lots of follow-ups to make sure that they're do using the device correctly. Never assume. <laughs> what about renal clearance of ACE ARB that may affect contraindication? Yes. Sure. So in general, in poor kidney function or someone who's uh temporarily kidney impaired. It's one of those uh, SATMED drugs that is temporarily held. So renal clearance at low renal function could affect ACE or ARB. Sometimes it is held. And Maggie, do you schedule appointments or do you for meter selection and training or do you do it on the spot? We do it as patients come in. So it's definitely not always ideal um, when you are extremely busy, but it would be too hard to try and schedule them, um, especially if you have a new patient that's just coming in and they've been newly diagnosed and we just don't go through that. Um, so it's definitely hard some days, but as they come in, we just deal with it as we go. Thank you. And uh, here's a good one. Do you have any ideas for improving patient engagement? We often find patients are just not interested in appointments or don't show up. Maybe you could give some advice on that. Yeah, so I think uh, when they come in for the refill, they still have to show up at the pharmacy and that's when you get a chance to engage them really and talk to them about their condition, see how it's going. And maybe talk about like, hey, why is the refill late or how's it going, how are your blood sugar levels? So this is a chance where you might wanna get them to, instead of just pick up and go home, put a note on it that the pharmacist wants to talk to them and bring them over to the council window, see how it's going. 
One of the another, ideas. Go, go ahead. Another thing to do uh, is if they're waiting for the prescription, you have 20 minutes to half hour where the patient is just going to be wandering around and sitting there. You can offer the service at that point. Then they're not just waiting, they're getting a service as the prescription is being filled. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Take advantage of that situation. I also find that sometimes people think they know everything. And then if you can ask them a question, do you know about, you know, driving and diabetes or something? And um, that's often will, uh, you'll recognize that they, they have some gaps in knowledge that you can help with the education portion. Because it is all about education. Um, another question on, is there any benefit in changing from Lantus to 2GO or 2JO, depends how you say it. Uh, the pack size is different. The units are more concentrated on 2GO sometimes. So at higher injection amounts, so we're talking like 50 to 100 unit range, it would reduce injection volume to use 2GO. So I think there would be benefits at higher dosing levels. Does it matter if we build a device under the doctor name or the pharmacist name? If you have a prescription from the doctor, um, I would bill it under the doctor's name, but if you don't have a prescription for it and you're just billing it to put it through the STI program, um, then the pharmacist's name is fine. Perfect. A patient complains that some blood comes out of the center of the freestyle Libra sensor and he's, he's worried. What can we suggest to the patient? I have never heard of that happening. Have you, Shane? Not really, but I have, not from our patients, but I have heard case reports of this. Uh, sometimes it hits a lump of uh, slightly larger capillaries than normal where the needle goes in. So on the next application, then moving the needle, the freestyle sensory, they're a little bit higher or lower to avoid that same spot or switching arms. Excellent. Well, that's, we've run out of questions. Um, I want to thank both of you for uh, an enlightening presentation. Uh, and I really appreciate um, you helping to support our um, commemoration of the 100 years of insulin. And it's so nice to see how far uh, healthcare professionals have gone. A um, couple of things for um, the people, the participants, you'll be getting a copy of the um, slides uh, with, in a, in a um, return email along with the recordings from tonight. So um, if anybody had to drop off early, they'll be able to see it and we'll have also have it on our website later on. And then uh, when you leave, there's gonna be a, an evaluation survey. Would really appreciate it if you would give us some feedback on this. Um, so without further ado, we're tired. We all had our, did 100 COVID shots today, apparently. Um, it's uh, really appreciate it again and have a good night, everybody.